Everybody, please mute your phones. Melina needs to mute, mute her phone. All right, welcome to the uh, Good Hormone Health webinar. Who should be treated? Who should be tested for growth hormone deficiency? We will discuss tonight causes of growth hormone deficiency. How Dr. Friedman differs from other endocrinologists with regard to growth hormone deficiency. Who should be tested? What tests are available? How to interpret the test? And what are the risk and benefit of growth hormone replacement? Uh, causes of the uh, growth hormone deficiency include pituitary problems, and this includes traumatic brain injury, TBI, which I'll be talking about a little bit. It's important to understand the different hormonal axes as related to the pituitary. You have the adrenal axis, which is the pituitary hormones called corticotrophs, and this axis, CRH, is made by the hypothalamus. It goes to the pituitary to make ACTH, and that goes to the adrenals to make the cortisol. The thyroid axis it is the TRH is from the hypothalamus. It goes to the thyroid tropes in the pituitary to make TSH, and it goes to the thyroid to make T4 and T3. The gonadal axis. Is, um, starts with GnRH in the hypothalamus, it goes to the pituitary to make LH and FSH, and it goes to the gonads to make testosterone and estrogen. The growth hormone axis is what we'll be talking today. The GHRH in the hypothalamus goes to the somatotrope cells in the pituitary to make growth hormone, and this goes to the liver to make this hormone IGF-1, which is the end product of growth hormone. The posterior pituitary makes AVP and oxytocin. Uh, the cause of the hypopituitarism could be anywhere along the hypothalamic stalk pituitary axis. Kevin Ewan and I published a paper in 2008, Clinical Endocrinology, showing that microadenomas can give hypopituitarism. And then there's this important area called of traumatic brain injury or concussions or head trauma that can also give hypopituitarism and growth hormone deficiency. Some of the classic causes of hypopituitarism include a pituitary tumor, microadenomas or and macroadenomas, pituitary surgery pituitary radiation, Sheehan syndrome, where the pituitary gets enlarged during pregnancy and could have like a mini stroke or a pituitary apoplexy when the woman delivers. This often gives a headache and um, a low blood pressure and can be followed by growth hormone deficiency. Hypophysitis, which is an inflammation in the pituitary, pituitary infiltrations, empty cella, which is the pituitary doesn't form properly. And you have the cella, the bony area surrounded by fluid. Malnutrition and critical illness can do it, and head trauma can also do it. And you can have stalk or hypothalamic causes of hypopituitarism. This includes craniopharyngiomas, CNS tumors, surgery, radiation, head trauma accidents, infiltrative diseases such as histiocytosis X, hemochromatosis, and sarcoidosis, infections, and then drugs, steroids, dopamine analogs, and somatostatin analogs can all do this. This is probably one of the most important slides, is there's an order of hormone deficiency. And growth hormone is actually the first hormone that becomes deficient if the pituitary is damaged. So this will occur before the other hormones, such as the gonadotropins, uh, FSH and LH are usually second, TSH is usually third, ACTH is fourth, prolactin is pretty well preserved, and the posterior pituitary hormones are often pretty well preserved. And it's possible that the order can be skipped but most of the time it's like this. So uh, we published this article in Clinical Endocrinology in 2008. We took 38 patients with non-secreting pituitary microadenomas. The mean tumor size was 4.2 millimeters. They had normal IGF-1 levels. 19% of the patients, 50%, were found to be growth hormone deficient. They had a higher body mass index than those that passed the GHRH arginine test, which is the test we did at that time, and also the healthy controls. 19%, 19 patients or 50% had at least one other pituitary hormone de deficit. And we concluded that a substantial number of patients with non secreting pituitary microadenomas were growth hormone deficient despite normal serum IGF 1 levels and had at least one other pituitary hormone de deficit, suggesting that non secreting microadenomas, used to be called adenomas, may not be clinically harmless. 
Patients with low IGF-1 and microenomes are even more likely to be growth hormone deficient. And many endocrinologists only test for hypopituitism, which we'll talk about shortly, if the patient has had prior surgery or radiation to the pituitary. And my approach is to measure pituitary hormones first in patients with symptoms of hypopituitism. And if this points to hypopituitism, then we get a pituitary MRI and do testing. If the MRI shows a small pituitary tumor and the IGF-1 is low, and the patient has symptoms of growth hormone deficiency, then I do a growth hormone stimulation test. Growth hormone deficiency is probably fairly common. Might, this might be an estimate, and there's estimated to be 50,000 adults with growth hormone deficiency in the United States that have already been diagnosed. My guess is only about 10% uh, of people have correctly been, have been diagnosed. And there's probably about 90% of the people out there that also have growth hormone deficiency that haven't, that haven't been diagnosed. So what's this about traumatic brain injury? This is a schematic here that your pituitary is at the base of the brain. It's surrounded by this bony area called the cella. When your brain gets pushed forward, for example, in your car accident, or push, it gets pushed back, when you hit your head against the steering wheel or the windshield wipers, that pituitary stalk, which connects the brain to the pituitary, can get stretched, the blood vessels can get damaged, and you don't get the proper message going from the hypothalamus up here to the pituitary down there. And this can give hypopituitarism, especially growth hormone deficiency. This shows that a traumatic head injury, closed or open, can lead to ischemia, cytotoxicity, inflammation. This affects apoptosis, which is called cell death, and neuroplasticity. And this, excuse me, and this could lead to growth hormone, <coughs> excuse me, growth hormone deficiency, which would be uh, some of the issues we'll talk about there shortly. We'd be include decreased muscle mass, increased fat mass, altered metabolic profile, decreased exercise capacity, reduced bone, um, uh, bone mineral density, increased fractures, and poor quality of life. Now, growth hormone is the most abundant pitu uh, pituitary hormone. Uh, hypothalamic factors regulate growth hormone secretion by the pituitary somatotrophs. This is stimulated for the most part by GHRH, but also by a hormone called ghrelin, and it's inhibited by somatostatin. Growth hormone receptors are in diverse cell types, and then IGF-1 is the primary media of growth hormone activity. Growth hormone directly increases local IGF-1 in target tissues, and growth hormone also releases hepatic IGF-1 that acts on tissue IGF-1-like IGF-1 receptors. So you have growth hormone receptors in target tissues, and you have growth hormone receptors in the liver. Both of these mediate their actions through IGF-1. So, um, there are uh, studies that show that patients with hypopituitism have increased mortality. This is suggested, but not proven to be due to growth hormone deficiency, as most of these papers corrected all the hormones except for growth hormone, and the, the uh, mortality still continued. Growth hormone deficiency in adults results in things such as decreased bone formation, increased fat mass or central obesity, decreased muscle mass, lipid abnormalities, increased thickness of blood vessels, increased inflammatory markers, impaired quality of life, increased number of sick days, impaired exercise tolerance. Most of these abnormalities are corrected by treatment. So if you can make the diagnosis, you put people on growth hormone, they can get much better. Growth hormone deficiency. If it's left uh, undiagnosed, adult growth hormone deficiency may lead to increased risk for premature mortality, significant morbidity, and multiple signs and symptoms, including increasing body mass, body fat, a decrease in muscle mass, weakness and fatigue, osteoporosis, increased risk of fractures, dyslipidemia, cardiovascular disease, impaired psychological well-being such as isolation, anxiety, or depression. So here's some of the picture, uh, schematic of this. Uh, the risk, these risk factors are related to growth hormone deficiency, central obesity, dyslipidemia, impaired glucose, oxidative stress, pro-inflammatory cytokines, endothelial dysfunction, which means the blood vessels don't work properly, and these lead to both the cardiovascular and cerebrovascular or stroke morbidity and increased cardiovascular mortality. Okay, so this um, slide I sort of alluded to before, but I think this is interesting. The rest of the endocrinologists in the world over here, they believe that growth hormone deficiency is rare. Idiopathic, which means without a clear cut cause of growth hormone deficiency does not exist. 
only if a patient had prior surgery or radiation or maybe severe head trauma should you look for it. Only severe cases of growth hormone deficiency should be treated, and you should also only treat growth hormone deficient patient, deficiency if the patient has other pituitary hormone deficiency. My view is, in general in medicine, you get a history and physical. If the patient has a constellation of symptoms, you try to look for the diagnosis. Growth hormone deficiency is not that rare. It explains symptoms in a selected number of patients. And I have also found most patients with both mild growth hormone deficiency and severe growth hormone deficiency treatment get better with treatment. And my view is that, and this is known, is growth hormone is the first hormone def deficiency in the current case of hyperpituitarism. So you don't have to wait till other uh, pituitary cells are affected. About 60% of the cells of pituitary are somatotrophs that make growth hormone. The pituitary insert could be mild to give growth hormone deficiency alone and not affect the other hormones. You don't need the other pituitary hormones to be deficient to have growth hormone deficiency. And conditions such as empty cell, Sheehan syndrome, and traumatic brain injuries are not that uncommon and can give you easily growth hormone deficiency. And you might not know, it, certainly with uh, the empty cell, um, you wouldn't know it unless you did the imaging test. So the person may have growth hormone deficiency and have a reason for it. They just may not know about it. So my approach is um, I'll get an IGF-1 if you have symptoms of growth hormone deficiency and you have some kind of potential damage to your pituitary, such as the Sheehan, traumatic brain injuries, empty cell. And I'll recommend a growth hormone simulation test if the IGF-1 is either frankly low or in the low normal range. Okay, and then in medicine here, we try to look at the risk and benefits of uh, testing and replacement here. So what's the risk and benefits of growth hormone deficiency and uh, replacement? Uh, the symptoms of growth hormone deficiency are pretty uh, uh, pronounced. Weight gain, trouble sleeping, psychological and psychiatric problems, including depression, mood swings, and irritability. Uh, low quality of life and, and poor functionality are much lower in patients with growth hormone deficiency. And all these symptoms are improved with growth hormone replacement. And then growth hormone replacement, again, you wanna look for something that's pretty bad if you're not treated with it and the treatment's pretty benign. Uh, growth hormone replacement has very little side effects. The main side effects are joint pain and swelling or edema. Some patients on growth hormone replacement can get worse if you need glucose control. It's really important in the literature. But in general, I find that patients feel so much better on growth hormone replacement they exercise more, they feel better, and their blood sugar improves. We're really talking just about these, mainly these two side effects, joint pain and edema, that are easy to monitor and usually don't happen unless the IGF-1 is quite elevated. So I like to compare this to mild cortisol deficiency. Most endocrinologists treat mild cortisol deficiency, and I don't want to make a case to not treat it. In many cases, and I have uh, you know, hundreds of patients on hydrocortisone, Many patients need hydrocortisone and should be given clear, especially if symptoms support it. But in many borderline cases, it's unclear whether hydrocortisone needs to be given. When you give ex exogenous or you know, cortisol from the pill, hydrocortisone, it shuts down the adrenal glands from making its own hydrocortisol. And therefore, once you start cortisol, it may be very hard to stop it. The growth hormone is in that way. You give the growth hormone, the pituitary still makes some growth hormone, you can stop it in the pituitaries growth hormone comes back and it starts working again. And excess cortisol replacement leads to weight gain, diabetes, infections, osteoporosis. Most, any, many endocrinologists erroneously feel that patient can die suddenly from cortisol deficiency and occasionally they can. Unfortunately, if I had two patients in the past from adrenal, crisis, adrenal insufficiency, one probably had a crisis, but it's not that common. And in general, that patient was very undertreated um, and had severe deficiency. So it's sort of unlikely that the mild patient will have much of a problem if you don't treat them with uh, growth hormone deficiency, but um, the severe patient may. So this is in contrast to growth hormone deficiency where the, the mild patients really do better and really don't have much of a problem with going on growth hormone. Uh, so more recent literature suggests that patients with mild cortisol deficiency do not die suddenly, do not need to be treated with hydrocortisone, and the benefits of treating with exogenous hydrocortisone most likely outweigh the risk unless it's severe. So, and I, I made a case here, the rest of the world versus me. 
for treating, for testing for and treating the hormone deficiency. It's up to you as a patient which uh, path you want to follow. So how do you diagnose growth hormone deficiency? First of all, growth hormone is, come, is in pulses. So random growth hormone is not helpful. You could be at the top of the pulse or the bottom of the pulse and just measure the growth hormone is really out. So growth hormone then goes to the liver to make IGF-1. So we usually screen for IGF-1 in sort of, like I said, below sort of the lower half of the range or, the, or below the range. Here, I'm going to just even say for somebody that's coming off the street and doesn't, you know, wants to know whether they should see me and wants to know whether they could have growth hormone deficiency, I would say that um, if it's in the top 50%, it's less likely. If it's in the lower 50%, it's more likely. If certainly if you have history of empty cell, uh, head trauma, headaches, and low blood pressure after uh, delivery, such as Sheehan syndrome, history of pituitary surgery or radiation or pituitary tumor, uh, micro or macroadenoma, all these make growth hormone deficiency more likely. So in the IGF-1, if it's uh, less than 75, it's quite likely. If it's in the lower 25%, it's worse for stimulation test. And then sort of individual cases would be, what do you do with the people between the 25 percentile and the 50th percentile? So I'll go over this a little bit more in depth, but basically there's, there's three different types of testing for growth hormone. There's a glucagon stimulation test. Um, it's usually a pretty standard test. It's been around for about 20 years now. Um, and the cutoff for growth hormone is often three. Sometimes I use five. The insulin tolerance test is a more brutal test. It involves giving insulin and causing hypoglycemia, and then the growth hormone reacts to hypoglycemia. Um, most patients don't want to get hypoglycemic, and most doctors don't want to do the test. So this test is somewhat going out of favor, but some people still do it. The cutoff for this test is five often. And then there's this new test called the macular stimulation test, which I'll be talking about. So I want to emphasize that IGF only a screening test, it can't be used to diagnose growth hormone deficiency. Um, and um, growth hormone, as I said, is pulsatile. They're, they're through IGF-1. And the IGF-1 is a good measure of, of integrated growth hormone secretion. However, there's a big overlap between uh, patients and normals. So here is the range of the normals between these two bars here. And you have a lot of patients, and it, you can see that it declines with age. You have a lot of patients that are below the uh, mean for both men and women, but you have a lot of patients also within the, um, the range. You can see it here, uh, of both men and women here. So you cannot base it, um, you cannot diagnose growth hormone deficiency based on either the growth hormone level or an IGF-1 level you need to do a stimulation test. Your IGF-1 levels decrease with age and tend to be lower in patients that are obese, which makes it a little more complicated. But in general, I use the IGF-1 as a screen, and then you do the growth hormone skin test. The tests, again, are the glucagon test. Um, cutoff is often three, so I use up to five. Insulin tolerance test, the growth hormone is less than five, and the maximum test. So this uh, schemata lists the different types, the insulin tolerance test, it's an intravenous test, there's six blood draws. Um, there's at least two hour minimum time. It needs intensive medical supervision. Um, it's contraindicated in patients with epilepsy aged greater than 55 with a history of strokes or ischemic heart disease. And you get uh, neuroglycopenia or low blood sugar, seizures, loss of consciousness, delayed hyperglycemia. This is not a pleasant test to do. Most patients don't want to do it. Most doctors don't want to do it. In contrast, the glucose simulation test, I think, is much more benign. However, it still requires an intramuscular injection of glucose, of glucagon. It's nine blood draws. It takes four hours for the patient. You don't need much supervision. Um, it's contraindicated in malnourished patients, patients who are not eating for greater than 48 hours, patients with hyperglycemia with a blood sugar greater than 180, fasting, not on treatment. Um, if somebody's on with diabetes, you can treat them and then you can still do the test. Uh, the side effects are uh, less than this, but still some. Most patients get nauseousness. We usually keep some Zofran around in the office. We we'll do the stem test to help prevent the nauseousness. Vomiting, headache, delayed hyperglycemia is rare, sweating, and abdominal cramps. So the newest test, the Macklin test, is an oral test. You drink a solution. 
There's four blood draws, so it's much less than these tests. It only takes an hour and a half, and there's really no supervision or minimal supervision. No contrary, it can be done on basically everybody, but it also still has to be fasting. Um, the main side effect is what's called dysgeusis, which is a bad taste in your mouth. That's the most common side effect. Dizziness, fatigue, headache, nausea, and hunger are all side effects of the macular test. This was published in August 2018 in the Journal of Clinical and Endocrinology Metabolism. First author is Garcia. Macrolin is, a, is an agonist of ghrelin. Ghrelin is made by the stomach and goes to the pituitary gland to stimulate growth hormone, which then goes to the liver to make IGF-1. Um, it's made in, um, ghrelin is made in the gastrointestinal tract. Macrolin stimulates endogenous ghrelin and binds to the growth hormone receptor in the pituitary and um, causes release of hormones into the circulating system. In vivo macrolin has similar growth hormone releasing activity as uh, ghrelin. So in the study of JCNM by Garcia, they did a, a study where they compared macrolin against the insulin tolerance test. It was a phase three study. Then there was a reproducible study that showed that once you did the macrolin test, you got a second result similar. Um, 157 subjects were involved. They either did the ITT versus the macrolin test first, or the macrolin test versus the ITT. 140 patients completed both tests, and then they reproduced it, either the second test, if the macrolin was the second test, they reproduced it, or if the macrolin was the first test, they reproduced it to see how reproducible the test was. The endpoint was an agreement in the diagnosis of growth hormone deficiency and uh, whether they were positive or negative, and they used a cutoff of 2.8 for macrolin, and a positive result suggests to the patient under both tests, the ITT and the macrolin, suggests the patient has a growth, adult growth hormone deficiency. A negative agreement was they had, um, um, a, 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 that they, they agreed that the test um, showed the patient did not have growth hormone deficiency for the ITT and the macrolin. The ITT cut off was 5.1, the macrolin cut was 2.8. And this shows that the patient does not have growth hormone deficiency. 99% uh, of the macrolin tests were evaluable in the first attempt. It was almost always done successfully. While only 83% of the patients uh, could do the, uh, the insulin tolerance test the first time, either they, uh, had, they didn't want to do it or they had trouble with it. So the macrolin test was very, uh, very well tolerated by the patient and was able to get results, which is crucial. So in terms of sensitivity and specificity between the uh, macrolin test and the insulin tolerance test, there was 87% sensitivity. This is the problem with the test result is positive in somebody that has growth hormone deficiency by the ITT. And specific, specificity was very good at 96%. This is the problem with the test result is negative in patients that does not have growth hormone deficiency as diagnosed by the insulin tolerance test. So the, tip, the study, is, um, this, uh, study shows that the macrolin test is a very good test to do for testing growth hormone deficiency as good or if not better than the ITT, but much more benign and easier to tolerate. It's highly reproducible. 91% of the patients had a matching result that either they were positive the first time, they were positive the second time, and uh, they were negative the first time, and they're negative the second time. There's only three patients or 9% that had a positive one time and a negative the other time. I guess with the uh, ITT, you'll have much more variability related to that. Adverse effects, 4.5% had the problem with the taste and bad taste, 3.9% dizziness, headaches, fatigue, nauseousness, hunger, diarrhea, all fairly low. And this, um, you got the, the, some of them got um, the feeling of like having a pharyngitis, uh, stuffy nose, sinus bradycardia was pretty rare. Nobody had to stop the test because of side effects. What do you do for the Macklin test? How do you tell your patients? Um, you should before testing macrolin, you shouldn't take a patient that has adrenal insufficiency, who's not treated and having to do the test, for example, or somebody with hypothyroid. I don't think they have to be perfectly replaced, but they should be replaced with their other hormones. They have to fast at least eight hours before the test, which is the same as in the glucagon test. Um, they should avoid use of macrolin with drugs that belong to this QT interval and part of their uh, cardiology, their EKG. This includes antipsychotics, antibacterials, uh, arrhythmic drugs, um, amiodarone, quinidone, quinidine, procainamide, totalol. 
medicines, and I'll go over this again, and a strong CYP3A4 inducers and um, other drugs that affect growth hormone release, um, such as uh, especially birth control pills and oral estrogen, I'd have the patient at least stop those a month before as they um, block the action of growth hormone the liver and give you high growth hormones, so you're more likely to falsely pass the growth hormone test, but a low IGF-1. It's important to stop your, your uh, estrogen, oral estrogen or growth control pills, a patch of estrogen or cream is okay. What they do is a solution. The doctor weighs out the solution here. They must drink the solution within 30 seconds. Um, they draw four blood samples, 30, 45, 60, and 90 minutes. They prepare the samples and send them off to the lab. Now there's the CYP3A4 inhibitors and inducers. Um, inhibitors lowers these and lay, may lead to increased macular levels and a false positive test. The inducers may increase the macular levels and lead to a false negative test. I don't think patients need to stop glucocorticoids. I think the fact that glucocorticoids is pretty mild. Um, I would stop, I usually have my patients stop ketoconazole a month, a week before the testing, as the ketoconazole can affect this macular test. Does it affect glucagon? Just the macular test. Okay, the cutoff is interesting. Um, so in the they had a predefined cutoff of 2.8 based on what the FDA wanted here. But in terms of actually the best specificity and sensitivity, it was uh, 5.1 here. 5 point, uh, yeah, 5.1. And uh, within this range, people had a good agreement. Um, but I think this is um, an interesting point is should you use 2.8 or 5.1? I'll go into that in a second. So the FDA has a cutoff of macrolin of 2.8. Although the paper in the JCM found that a growth hormone level of 5.1 gave the highest separation between normal and growth hormone deficient subjects. And I may start patients on growth hormone, see how they do on it, who has a peak response between 2.8 and 5.1 because of that paper showing that gave the best price, the separation between normals and growth hormone deficient patients. Uh, for glucagon, the endocrine side represents a cutoff of three. Um, I may also start patients on a trial, both their levels between three and five. Um, some authors have argued that um, obese patients should have a cutoff of one. I think that was based on too few patients and it was sort of, again, relying on the insulin tolerance test, which may not be that accurate. I think obese patients, you can still use the cutoff of three. What's the difference between the glucose and the macular test if you're interested in one of the tests? The glucagon test, I charge 695. It does not need a pre-authorization. It is a muscle, intramuscular injection. Most patients get nauseous. And I think I said before nine, actually there's seven blood draws for the most part on the test. So there's a lot more blood draws. The macular test, I charge $350 because I don't have to pay for the macular and the glucon is quite expensive. Uh, but it does require pre-authorization. The pre-authorization may take a month. Some insurances don't cover it at all, including Blue, uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield, some of the bigger insurances don't cover it all. Um, and if it's not covered, you have to pay $5,000 for, for the in cash for the product. So nobody wants to do that. So basically, if your insurance covers it, um, then we can go ahead and do the macular. If insurance doesn't cover it, we can go ahead and do the glucagon test. The macular test is an oral solution, and there's four blood draws. So not so bad. So I offer both of these tests on my Tuesday night clinic. If you're a new patient, please send me your IGF-1 and a brief history related to pituitary, such as if you had prior surgery or were growth hormone deficient as a child. Um, to, for the, sort of a screen, um, I'll take, I think people should get the test if it's in the lower 50% of the range. You know, the IGF-1 is usually has a number called a Z-score. If it's a negative number, it might say less than 0 0.1 or 0 0.5. Then I would say you're in the, then, you're, then you are in the lower 50%, and then I think it's worth doing the test. If you're in the upper 50%, it's probably a chance of uh, failing the test are quite low. It's probably not worth doing it. Uh, if you're coming from out of town, let us know in advance so we can uh, do the pre-authorization for the Macalin. And you can have your appointment and a STEM test on the same night. Both of these tests require uh, uh, fasting for uh, eight hours. And water and medicines are okay for both of the tests, but no eating because it hasn't been standardized for that.
I have some other articles on my website, goodhormonehealth.com, that people may be interested in. There's one that's entitled Adult Growth Hormone Deficiency, Mild Growth Hormone Deficiency versus Mild Cortisol Deficiency, which one should you treat? Macrolin stimulation test versus glucagon stimulation test for adult growth hormone deficiency, growth hormone treatment in pregnancy and breastfeeding, and hormones and brain injury the junior sale suffer from pituitary dysfunction. So feel free to look on my website for these. Okay, so we'll open up to questions. Uh, please, your chat button. Thank you for sharing your time tonight. If you have um, more questions after, the, after tonight or want an appointment, please email us. Um, I can't give you uh, guidance on treatment either tonight or um, by email until I see you, but I'm happy to answer some general questions. Uh, my website, as people know, is goodhormonehealth.com, and we'll be posting the uh, webinar in a few days on that. People can go ahead and use the chat button and ask the questions on the chat button. I'll repeat them and then try to answer them. Any questions, everybody? Here we go from Marina. Well, I want to know if it would be advisable for patients on a keto diet to stop the diet before the glucagon test. Um, I don't think we know what happens with the keto diet on the test, so I think I probably would stop it for probably a week before the test, just to make sure it's not affecting things. Questions? If my primary from Jen, if my primary provider were to order an IGF one, how is that ordered? So both Quest and LabCorp do it, and they do both of them do a fairly good job. Um, so they can just order it through them and then have them send it to me. Uh, Marina asked, "What are the chances someone who had growth hormone deficiency as a child have it as an adult?" That's a great question. So I think it depends on what caused it as a child. If you as a child had it based on you had a tumor, you had an empty blood, you had head trauma, you had surgery for craniopharyngioma, it's very likely you're going to have it as an adult. If you had an idiopathic growth hormone deficiency, they did an MRI and they didn't find anything, then I think the chances are lower, but there's still some. And it's definitely worth testing, especially your own growth hormone, you did pretty well, you stopped it and you did worse. Um, I would say if that's the case, you should do the test. Kelly asks, uh, what aside, other things aside from growth hormone impact IGF-1? So weight, people that are overweight have lower IGF-1. People that have um, malnutrition have lower IGF-1. Um, so those are the two things. Um, Lisa asks, any idea if the Mayo Clinic in Rochester does the Macron test? I would think they do, but I'm not 100% sure. You can ask them. Oh, Jen asked, both of my daughters have growth hormone deficiency. I am 4'9". Is this likely a genetic cause? I wasn't diagnosed. Um, there's definitely genetic cause of growth hormone deficiency. And um, I think it's worth uh, doing the growth hormone test as an adult now to see if you are growth hormone deficient. If you have, especially if you have some of the symptoms I talked about, I think it would be a very good reason to get tested. Pat asks, I am on growth hormone replacement. How do I determine the ideal dose? What is the ideal IGF-1 to aim for? I usually aim for an IGF-1 in sort of the mid to upper range. So let's say the range is, you know, 100 to 300. I would aim for about 200 to 250 or so. And you want to go by symptoms. The main symptom of growth hormone deficiency, as I mentioned, is swell, swelling and joint pains. And if you have those symptoms and your IGF-1 is only um, about, um, you know, if it's in the mid range, you don't want to go up. You might want to go down. If you're near the top of the range, then you want to probably um, um, could cut it down, especially if you're having symptoms. I try not to, I think this is someone else's question. This is from Art here. Um, I'm on growth hormone. My IGF-1 always runs a bit higher than the reference range. Is there any reliable studies showing decreasing it? I would decrease it. I think it's a, um, from other studies, we know that high growth hormone, high IGF-1 does lead to malignancy. And I think, you know, it's over a large number of people that that happens. It may not necessarily be for you but I think your chances of getting cancers are higher 
if your IGF-1 is above the range, as long as you keep it in the range, I would not, we were too worried about it. Lisa asks, is this something you take the rest of your life or you can't be cured from this? I would say you can't be cured from this. And I would say also about 90% of my patients on growth hormone love it and you know, feel really bad if they happen to miss a dose because their insurance doesn't cover it uh, properly and there's delays in coverage. They feel really bad. Um, almost nobody wants to stop it. I do have about 10% of the patients that this just doesn't help them with. And uh, they don't, you know, I say, if it's not helping you, then you can go ahead and stop it. But most of the patients, it, uh, it does help. And, you know, I keep patients on. I have some patients in their 80s. I have a husband and wife team that now live in North Carolina. They are, they're both on it. They're doing great on it. So I think you can keep it um, um, as late in your life. There was one study that came out that suggested that you can't stop it with age, um, but I'm not sure you should, but I think that was an interesting study, but you have to look at um, what happens to each person if they stop it. Kelly asked, what happens if somebody with hyperthyroidism with an IGF-1 in the top half of the range, but deficient, can they still be treated? So in general, the IGF-1 is a pretty good screen. So I usually don't test people, even if they have other hormones deficient, if their IGF-1 is the top half of the range. Um, you know, if you have a lot of symptoms and you're sort of borderline, sometimes I would test stimulate somebody but in general, I usually reserve my stem tests to the IGF-1 in the bottom half of the range. Jason asked my HGH therapy is 0.225. I still fatigue and apathetic. Does this dose seem right? I think you have to check the IGF-1 level. So it's really different people require vastly different uh, testing. I'm sorry, vastly different dosing. Some can be on a low dose. Some can be on a high dose. This is usually expressed in milligrams. I presume this is 0.225 milligrams, that's a low dose, uh, a relatively low dose, but it's okay dose for a man. Um, and um, you have to see what the IGF-1 is, um, and you have to maximize your other hormones too. But I would try to, you know, if, if you're still having symptoms, I would push the IGF-1 nearer to the top of the range. Christina asked, if the maximum test is not covered by insurance, the cost would be 5K, what is the non-insurance cost of the test? So there's two things here. Thank you for asking this, Christina. One is the cost of the drug. The drug itself costs $5,000, and the drug itself would have to be paid by the patient unless it's covered by insurance. The test, as I went in one of my slides, the glucagon test is $695, and then I give you a super bill that you submit to your insurance. The maximum test itself is um, $350, and we could give you the, the test, but your insurance are already covered the, the maximum, so probably not going to pay that much more of that. And then you also have to pay for the test, which usually insurances do cover for the blood draws for the glucagon, for the growth hormone. Janet, hi Janet, ask, um, oh sorry, we have Jen first, a couple other ones first, sorry about that. Um, okay, he says, can low growth hormone affect liver readings? Um, I don't think so particularly. Um, Severe liver disease can lead to low IGF-1, but it's not really the other way around. Kelly asks, is there anything other than IGF-1 you monitor for patients on treatment? Mostly the IGF-1 and symptoms, um, definitely. Um, in children, we look at the IGF binding proteins. It's not that helpful in adults, really. The IGF-1 is better. Is there a cor Marina asks, is there a correlation between growth hormone deficiency and hypoglycemia? Uh, hypoglycemia is a symptom of growth hormone deficiency, and it's, I think it's a really a common cause of, of growth hormone, of hypoglycemia. If somebody has hypoglycemia, especially if they have a low IGF-1 and symptoms, other symptoms of growth hormone deficiency, I would test them and treat them. And usually when you're treated, the symptoms of hypoglycemia do go away. Jen asks, uh, what is the current recommendation for kids as they are taken off growth hormone for future follow-up? So I'm not a pediatrician, um, but I would say when they're taken off, they should get um, their IGF-1 looked at, um, you know, every year or so for a couple of years. Um, if they start having symptoms of growth hormone deficiency, they should um, do um, a growth hormone test. And I would say, again, it's probably worth doing an MRI if they haven't had one done. If they have something structural wrong with their pituitary, they had surgery, radiation, they have a small pituitary, um, they have a tumor, then they're likely to be growth hormone deficient and they should definitely, you know, get the follow-up testing. 
if they are not that likely to be, uh, if their imaging is normal, they're less likely to have it. But you know, some I had a few patients that uh, had it as a child and their test was sort of borderline. So I figured they're more likely to benefit from it. And then certainly they are doing better on it. Then it asks if one is increasing growth hormone replacement and hypothyroidism, is it possible to need more cortisol? Yes, this is a great question. Janet asks and always asks good questions. So um, there is an enzyme called 11 beta HSD. There's one and two. The enzyme um, number one causes mostly cortisol to cortisone, and cortisone is inactive. And then, but it also can go both ways. And then the other one, um, the, the, the HS, 11A beta HSD2 is mostly in the adrenals and then sorry, in the kidneys, and it causes cortisol to go, um, cortisol to go to cortisol. And growth hormone pushes it in the direction of cortisol to cortisone. So if you're both growth hormone deficient and cortisol deficient, the cortisol deficiency is usually pretty mild because the growth hormone deficiency protects you from breaking down the cortisol and you have more actually cortisol involved. Once you start growth hormone, you will either need cortisol or you may need more cortisol because that enzyme is causing it to be broken down more. Okay, Kat's question is, my pretreatment IGF-1 varies from minus three to minus 1.5 standard deviation. So that's that Z-score I mentioned. When does, uh, why, when, I think she means, why does the IGF-1 vary so widely between these blood tests and what is supposed to be a better marker? Do you recommend testing any time of the day? What are the very, very least affect the IGF-1? Uh, there is a very, somewhat variation in the assay. I think that it's also somewhat variation of the day. I would probably check it uh, first thing in the morning fasting, probably more, a little more reliable. There's a slight effect of food on it. Um, and there's also different labs that have different values. Um, so, you know, you, whatever it is, your, your numbers are pretty low. And you should do a stim test on you, I would say, um, of what you, what you described here. Um, so the better test is really the stim test. Kelly asks, IGF-1 is used to screening for dosing. What is responsible for growth hormone deficiencies? Because I would say the IGF-1 is primarily responsible. Right? If you do not have enough IGF-1, you're going to have growth hormone deficiency symptoms. ARCAS can low growth hormone cause kidney problems. I would say no. Um, I haven't seen that as a, as a correlation. I read about that. Okay. A lot of questions. I'm going to take some work. A couple of minutes still. Uh, Marina asks if somebody has untreated and undiagnosed growth hormone deficiency. It's possible that some desiccated thyroid can make them feel better with a normal thyroid range. So, you know, I would say there's, there are two different axes. You need your growth hormone treated, you need your thyroid treated. I use a fair amount of desiccated thyroid. I think it's very good. The only caveat is um, that growth hormone is involved in conversion from T4 to T3. And um, therefore, if you're growth hormone deficient, you're more likely to have low T3. And the desiccated thyroid that has T3 in it or taking a T4, T3 combination is usually more likely to make someone feel better than straight T4. So I think a, a person with undiagnosed growth hormone deficiency should be either first of all have their growth hormone replaced, uh, but also in the meantime have their desiccated thyroid replaced. Pat asked, do you ever remember, recommend growth hormone dosing more than once a day? Can it close the physiological pulses on growth hormone secretion? Um, so that's a good question also. I, I don't recommend, I think I recommend it more than once a day if you're at high doses. If you're usually above, say, 1.2 mils, I would, or 1.2 milligrams, I would do it just, I don't think it's that well absorbed. And I think people would do better on twice a day. The pulse of tile this, you can't really mimic by the, um, by giving it more than once a day. The pulses are quick. So um, you can't really um, do the pulse of tile. However, in men and children, most of the growth hormone is made at night. So we often give growth hormone at night. In women, it's not so pronounced, it's sort of even. I still give it mostly at night, but I would say in general, you know, when people fall asleep, they get, they get spikes of growth hormone. And when you're growth hormone deficient, you don't get those spikes and you have trouble sleeping. And therefore it's probably a good idea to uh, take your growth hormone at night. If you're on a high dose, you can try twice a day. A few patients have more side effects at night than in the morning. Occasionally I put people in the morning, but not too often. 
Yeah, so uh, CES IGF-1 is 8.2 nanomoles. I presume that's a European or non-American unit. Um, you know, America uses the, um, um, I guess, nanograms per deciliter unit for the um, IGF-1. And there is uh, formulas to convert them. Pat asked, does estrogen replace an effect by uh, growth hormone levels or replace the doses for uh, growth hormone? Um, so estrogen, oral estrogens and um, birth control pills block growth hormone at the liver. So they give you high growth hormone and low IGF-1. And you'll need a much higher dose of growth hormone if you're on birth control pills or oral estrogen to give you the same IGF-1. Therefore, I strongly advocate against, and I actually think it's almost contraindicated, to give people growth hormone deficiency, oral estrogens, or birth control pills. On the other hand, uh, patches of estrogen or creams of estrogen don't do this, so that's what I would recommend. Christina asked, does growth hormone replacement increase chances of cancer development? I would say no, as long as you keep your IGF-1 in the normal range. When it starts getting above the normal range, then you have a more of a chance of cancer development. Uh, me and I think the general, the rest of the world would not give growth hormone to somebody that already has cancer. Um, you know, you have breast cancer, colon cancer, something like that. I would not give growth hormone. If somebody had it in the past, is completely cured. Uh, I might still give it, but I'd be very cautious. Um, and um, if you're just a regular person, they've done sur sur surveillance studies that it does not increase the chance of the cancer development. Um, Jason asked, back in August, I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. My dose of hydrocortisone was 25 to 30. That's a pretty high dose. I'm down to 20 milligrams now. I think that's a, a better thing. Would you recommend additional testing of cortisol? Um, so first, I think there's sort of two questions in here. In general, as I said, Hydrocortisol is the axis that comes back to the first. So it's theoretically possible that you don't need hydrocortisone at all, um, especially since you're able to table it down nicely. And you can get a morning cortisol with you um, off the Cortef for 24 hours. So take it, say, a Sunday morning. Don't take it Sunday afternoon. Don't take it Monday morning. Get a cortisol. If your cortisol is zero, you need it the rest of your life. If your cortisol is like five or 10, you could probably be tapered off of it. The second question is, how do you know you're on the right dose? A lot of it's by symptoms, but you can do a 24-hour urine test. The most important test is the 17-hydroxy steroids, which many labs don't do anymore, but Quest does it, and LabCorp sends it out to Aerop that does it. And that's the more integrative effect of how the cortisol is affecting your whole body. Um, you could do the urine-free cortisol also, but that's not quite as good as the 17-hydroxy steroids, but that helps in sort of figuring out the right dose. Pat asks, I use a patch for now for estrogen, but when I had my arginine test to determine deficiency, I was on birth control pill, I came up borderline. So the birth control pills, again, would raise your growth hormone. So you're, you would probably be more severe, you'd probably be deficient if you weren't on it. So you can either repeat it again, I guess is probably the best test. Should I retake the simulation test? I would. And now I would, now that you're on a uh, patch, um, I would be better. And, you know, we're not really doing the arginine test anymore. Um, I would do either the glucagon or the macron test. Marina asks, would you advise treatment in a person who has a low normal test? I presume this is a, um, a stim test, I guess, um, versus a IGF-1. Um, you know, the stim test, um, the cutoff, I think, is a little controversial. I try to push for it. I try to get my patients the best care possible. Um, many times, sometimes insurance will deny it if it's sort of above what the uh, the Endocrine Society uses a three for the ghrelin, I'm sorry, three for the glucagon and 2.8 for the macrolin. Uh, but most of the time I usually win my, and I have Judy's very good at this, we usually win our appeals. Um, so I think it depends on each person, um, you know, what exactly the level is, how much hypopit you have, how what other hormones you have deficient, what are your symptoms, um, and, you know, can I sort of treat you with other things? Um, there is a supplement called Cerevital that stimulates uh, growth hormone that doesn't need, um, you know, insurance coverage. And it's also, I was going to add this uh, also, um, you can now get growth hormone from some compounding pharmacies. Um, that's pretty reasonable in cost without going through the insurance. Somewhere between $500 and $1,000 a month, depending on your dose. Um, so some of the patients, the insurance denies it. Um, I may have them pay, be able to pay uh, out of cash. I don't, I cannot legally 
prescribe growth hormone to someone who's not growth hormone deficient, but I think I'm sort of have a little liberty to determine who is growth hormone deficient and who isn't. Lisa asked, my insurance is requiring to switch growth hormone brands. Are all brands equally effective? Basically, yes. Um, and um, the, they, the insurance companies are always uh, having different brands. I think the important thing is to get tested again once you switch your brand. Some of my patients don't do as well on one brand versus the other. If that's the case, you know, we can document it. You're on this brand two and you did better on brand one. We can appeal it and usually have you go back to brand one. But we usually can't do that without um, you trying brand two and not doing well on it. I usually have people go on to what they recommend. And then if they don't do well on the growth, the IGF-1 is good, then we can appeal it. He says, I produce zero cortisol fonts for doing surgery. So I'm on hydrocortisone. Can the IST probably ITT or the test called the crisis? I would say yes. Um, I would probably not do an ITT. The glucagon test and the macron test should be no problem. Um, but I would be nervous about doing an ITT. says, I've been on human growth hormone for 12 years. We retested for deficiency. How long would I have to be off of it? Um, I would say off of it a month. I'm not sure why you'd want to be retested unless your insurance company requires it or unless you're, it's not really helping you, I guess. Um, if it's not helping you, I would stop it. If it's helping you, I would just stay on it um, because you're tolerated it well. I'm not sure I would retest. And, you know, if your insurance company would requiring it, you can sort of make a case that the literature doesn't recommend retesting. That says Medicare is covering it, maybe she needs Medicare is requiring it. Um, if, you know, insurance requires it, you can try to appeal it or you can go ahead and just do the test again. No, they are covering my prescription after. Kelly asks, if someone has to come off growth hormone for a reason, do they have to retest to go back on it? No, I mean, I think if you definitely failed your test, you can get put back on it. I usually start slower and, you know, like go to half dose for a couple of weeks before going up to the full dose. Well, final questions? Kelly says, thank you for everything you do. Thank you. Pat says, thank you. So uh, we'll uh, close it here. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Again, I'll be post. Thank you. Uh, very informative. I'll be posting this. Thank you very much, Dr. F. Um, I'll be posting this on my website a couple of um, days, and we should have another one coming up a few um, month or two. Um, thanks everybody. Bye-bye.